So I'm going to show you some code today. Now, ordinarily, I don't like talks with a lot of code in them because I think they're tedious and boring. And this talk promises to be no exception. But um, code is the story, and, and so it's not possible to tell this otherwise. So the topic this morning is monads. Monads, what are monads? Monads are the strange, mysterious, weird, but powerful, expressive pattern that we can use for doing programming. And they come with a curse. The monadic curse is that once someone learns what monads are and how to use them, they lose the ability to explain it to other people. There's lots of evidence of this on, on the web. Um, you know, go and, and search for um, monads, tutorials, burritos, any of those things, and you're going to find a lot of really confusing material. So today I'm going to attempt to break that curse and show you monads for what they actually are. So we're going to start with functional programming. Uh, that if you, if you can't do functional programming, then none of the rest of this is going to make sense. But I'm assuming you're all professionals and, and this should not be difficult material. So there are two senses of the term functional programming. One of them simply means to program with functions. So we'll look at that first. Functions enter mainstream programming with Fortran 2. Uh, this is a Fortran 2 function. At that time, um, lowercase hadn't been invented yet, so all, everything was in uppercase. But it looks quite a lot like a modern function. I mean, it starts with the word function and has the name of the function and parameters wrapped in parentheses, separated by commas, really conventional stuff. So it was just a subroutine that had the ability to return a value. And it returned that value in a slightly strange way, using an assignment statement which would assign a value to the name of the function. And then the return statement would deliver that to the caller. Um, that has been changed since then, and now everybody has a return statement that takes a value and that works better. Or in expression languages, the last expression evaluated by a function is the implied return value. But what we call functional programming only becomes interesting when we have functions as first class objects. So we can take a function and pass it as a parameter or store it in any, any variable or stick it in a field in a, in a record. That's when it becomes interesting. Um, and then we can have higher order functions in which you have functions which operate on other functions as arguments. And this all became really good stuff with the invention of Scheme. And in Scheme, we have lexical closure, which means that any function has access to the variables in the outer function. And it turns out that was an enormous breakthrough. And that is now finding its way into mainstream languages. Anyone have any idea which was the first mainstream language to have this feature? It was JavaScript. That's right. JavaScript is leading the way. So um, the other sense of functional programming is sometimes called pure functional programming. And it means functions are mathematical functions, which is quite different than subroutines that return arguments because a subroutine is allowed to do mutation. And in a purely mathematical function, that doesn't happen. Uh, a function for, with some input is always going to have the same output. And the argument in favor of that style of programming is it makes programs a lot easier to reason about because you don't have bugs that will occur as a result of side effects of something else happening. If something works, it's guaranteed to work that way correctly till the end of time. And that could be hugely beneficial. But uh, there are problems that come with that. So um, you could think of mathematical functions as being maps. You know, it will simply take some parameter or parameters and map them to some value. And that mapping is constant, and so it always works that way, and so it's easy to predict. So whether functions are implemented as computation or as association is just an optimization trick. Um, all functions should work exactly the same way either, t either time. Um, so, you know, the difference is sort of like the difference between memoization and caching. Um, caching is a deal with the devil, right? It, it, you know, we have something which is likely to be wrong, but is sometimes right, and we don't know when it transitions from being right and wrong. With memoization, that never occurs. Once it's memoized, it's right and will always be right. Um, so, 
we can take any ordinary programming language and turn it into a purely functional programming language by deleting stuff. So we can remove everything from the language which could have side effects. So we can remove the assignment statement. We can remove loops and use recursion instead if we need repetition. We can freeze all array literals and object literals so that um, once minted, they cannot be modified. In languages like JavaScript, it means removing date because every time you call date, it returns a different value. That's mathematically absurd, right? Every time you call function, it should return the same thing. Uh, same with random. Every time you call random, you hope you get a different value, but that's, that doesn't make sense mathematically, so we want to remove that. So if we remove all those things from our languages, then we'll have purely functional languages, and we'll also find we're not going to be able to get anything done anymore. Because most of our programs are not doing pure computation, they're interacting with the world. And the world is constantly changing, and if our programs can't change with them, then they become brittle and ineffective. Because in the real world, everything changes. Um, and immutability makes it hard to work in the real world. Now, there are um, uh, pure functional programming languages, like ML and like uh, Haskell is a better example. Um, and Haskell is a brilliant language. And uh, they were doing interesting computations with it. And then there was the idea, let's try to do practical stuff in it. And then suddenly, it gets really, really hard. The, 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 that kind of hard is sometimes called impossible because you can't have any side effects. You can't do I.O. How do you interact with things without being able to do I.O., without being able to mutate? So they discovered a trick. There was a loophole in the function contract. And that loophole is that a function can take a function as a parameter. And once it does that, every time a function is called with a function, every function is going to be different. Right? Because every function is a unique thing which is closed over the thing that created it. And so it sort of gives us a way to escape from the uh, side effect free thing. You just need to start thinking about how you compose functions in such a way that you have the illusion of having mutability without actually mutating anything. Um, so. Uh, the Haskell community had reason to adopt something called the I.O. monad because it gave them the ability to act as though the language had I.O. even though it didn't. And so as they're calling things, they can be assembling state and that state kind of follows forward in the um, computation and it kind of works. And it's like, hooray, you know, it, it's, it can be used for practical programming, except it's kind of hard. Um, and it turns out that you want mutation you know, because you know, that is how the world works. And so the IO monad is a solution to a problem you should never have. But it turns out there are lots of other monads, and so um, they're still worth taking a look at. Um, now, there are some who will say, in order to understand monads, you first have to learn Haskell and you have to learn category theory. If you don't know these things, there's just no, ways, no way to start. You can't learn monads. I think that is true in exactly the same way that in order to understand burritos, you must first learn Spanish. And they're true in the same way in that neither is true. Um, it turns out you can do a lot of stuff with burritos without knowing any Spanish. You can order them. You can eat them and enjoy them. You can even learn to make them. You can even learn to invent new kinds of burritos which you and your friends can enjoy, and you can do that without learning any Spanish. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn Spanish. There are lots of good reasons to learn Spanish. You can um, learn a lot more about Mexican cuisine, for example, and, and that will allow you to make burritos and other things which are more authentic and perhaps even better. Um, it'll allow you to have interactions with some wonderful people you would never interact with otherwise. And if you're one of the job creators, it gives you an opportunity to talk directly to the people who are actually doing your work for you. That's a good thing, right? So uh, in the same way, it's good to learn Haskell. Haskell has a lot of good stuff in it. It can teach you a lot. It's a good language to learn. It's just not necessary to learn Haskell in order to understand monads. Now, some people will disagree with me and say, no, you have to start with Haskell. And I say, no. If you have the chicharrones, you can learn monads without Haskell. Um, now, there are some people who say, well, you at least have to start with the types. 
that you need a really strongly typed language or a super strongly typed language in order to manage monads. That you have to understand this before we begin. And I'm going to tell you, no, that's actually not true either. Um, Haskell has a wonderful type system in it. It does a lot of type inference so that you can underspecify what the program does and it will try to figure out all the types. But it doesn't always go right. And so if it is trying to solve your program and if it finds an inconsistency, it stops and you get this completely opaque message and which is indicating that it found an inconsistency in a place which is probably miles away from where the error actually is. And so getting that stuff to, to work and compile can be really hard. And once it's done, there is folklore which says, having gone through that ringer, you're guaranteed your program is going to be error free. And it turns out it's not. That there are subtle errors that happen in Haskell as happen in all other languages and the type system actually gives you no leverage in dealing with that stuff. There's just stuff gets complicated and when there's complexity, things go wrong. And that happens in all languages. It turns out that it's easier to reason about monads if you don't have to deal with the type stuff. You don't actually need to understand what that is in order to build a monad. Uh, now there's some who'll say, no, that's not true. You don't dare go that way otherwise. But I say, my friends, if you have the huevos, you can. So what do you say we sack up and look at some monads? It turns out the language you need to learn first is JavaScript. Um, because it has the higher order function stuff that we need and it doesn't have any of the type stuff to get in your way so you can just think about what's going on. So what we have here is a story of three functions. We have a function called unit that takes a value and returns a monad. We have a function called bind which takes a monad and returns a f and a function that takes a value that returns a monad. And that's it. So all three of these functions return monads and that's it, that's monads, thank you very much. So you're probably wondering still, what, what is a monad? A monad's an object in, in this case. It could be something else, but generally it's an object. So if you know anything about JavaScript, you're looking at the unit function, you're going, wait, unit is a function that takes a value and returns an object, so it must be a constructor, right? And yeah, right, that's it, that's exactly right. So unit is a constructor, so nothing magical there, so all the magic must be in the bind function. So um, and that, that's it, and there's not a lot of magic. So, in, so there are three axioms that you have to, to hold in order to be a monad. The first two describe the relation between bind and unit, which is basically that unit creates a monad that represents some value, and the bind function allows another function to have access to that value. And that, that's that. The interesting axiom is the third one, which tells us how we can do composition on the bind method, that we can have nested bind methods, and that does the same thing as calling bind with a function that calls bind. Um, that's it, that, that is monads. Um, now we can make it easier to deal with these monads by converting it from uh, functional notation into uh, methodical notation, right? Um, and that's, that's a really easy thing to do in JavaScript. Everybody does that all the time. You need to understand the mapping between functions and methods. And once you can do that, then we can very easily transform the way we invoke the bind method. Instead of saying bind passing a method or passing a monad, we'll call the monads uh, bind method. It's just an, an easier way to do that. Um, so in, in a lot of languages, or, or in some languages, say, uh, common Lisp, you would recognize that there are lots of different possible varieties of monads that you might want to implement, but they all have the same basic pattern. So you'd want to implement some kind of macro to make it easier for defining all of those different kinds of monads. JavaScript, unfortunately, does not have macros, but it does have functions, and so uh, we can create a special kind of function called a macroid, which acts like a macro, uh, which helps us to do that kind of thing that macros do. Um, and, uh, let's see, I, and so this is uh, one of those macroids. I want to say something about the coloring. So you've all seen syntax coloring, right? That's something we put in our text editors to make it easier for kindergartners to do programming. You know, because each of the elements of the language is a different happy bright color, and so it's easy to recognize, oh, that's a variable and that's a string and so on. 
I don't get a lot of value out of that because I'm more sort of a grown-up and I'm a professional programmer and I, I really don't need the colors to figure out what's a variable and what's a comment. But when I'm doing functional programming, I do, I would like to have color help me deal with the nesting of functions and deal with the closure. So I wish someone would make a text editor for me that does this. So um, I want all of my global level stuff to be white. Um, all the top level functions, I want them to be green. Uh, the functions defined inside of those would be yellow. The ones inside of those would be blue and so on. But the color of a variable is the color in which it was defined. And that allows me to see how things close. It gives me a view of the visibility of variables and their life expectancy and so on. And that turns out to be really useful stuff. So I'd really like to have this kind of uh, colorization. And I'm going to be using this sort of colorization through the rest of this talk. Okay, so, um, so we've got our, our uh, macroid, and we're going to use it to define a monad. And we're going to start with the identity monad. So the identity monad um, uh, will build the identity constructor, and we'll call the identity constructor, passing it the hello world string. And then when we call uh, monad.bind, uh, passing alert, the, the alert function as its method, we'll get the hello world thing. So this is the simplest possible, or the simplest useful, slightly useful monad, the identity monad. Um, so let's look at the axioms again using the uh, methodical notation that we just came up with. We previously looked at it functionally, now we're going to look at it methodically. And I think it actually makes more sense in this notation. I think it's easier to see what the relationship between uh, unit and bind is. But even better is the, the thing that happens in composition. That um, We now, now have this thing where we've got a monad and we call bind and it returns another monad and we can call bind again. This is a much easier composition pattern than the other one in which we had bind nested inside of bind. Because with the nesting you have to read the expressions from the inside out and that's a hard thing for us to do. But in the methodical form we can read it from left to right and so composition is a lot easier. I can just keep tacking things on and the thing keeps getting longer and more interesting, more complex. Now, any of you who have ever, ever done any Ajax programming might notice, wait a minute, there's something about this pattern that's familiar. I've got a, an object and I call a method on it and then I call another method on the result. Where have I seen that before? Well, it's the Ajax monad, right? All of the Ajax libraries do this, jQuery, YUI, everybody. We've been doing this for years. It turns out it's, we've been doing monads all along. So um, this is, um, an example of something I did in 2001. This, the Interstate Library was my third JavaScript library. The first one was um, just something to help me manage the differences between Netscape 4 and IE4, which were horrendous. Um, and after I wrote that, I looked at what sort of patterns we were using in, in using it and then trying to figure out a way to incorporate more of that into the library to make it easier to use. And, this is my third iteration, and in this one I, I realized that if I um, have an object which wraps a DOM node, in this case of a, a, uh, a text uh, form node, and if that uh, object, that monad, keeps returning itself, then I can cascade all of these other things on it, and it becomes really expressive. Um, and lots of other people figured this trick out as well, and so this is now standard equipment in Ajax libraries. In 2007, I developed a system called AdSafe, which was intended to make um, the web safe for doing online, ad online advertising. And it took the same idea of taking a node and wrapping it in a monadic object, but also added a security dimension to it. So it would, in, it would guarantee that there was no way that the node could be extracted from the object. So that meant we could give one of these AdSafe nodes to a piece of untrusted code, for example, uh, an advertisement, and be confident that it could not break the containment, that it was uh, only able to do with that node what we intended it to be able to do with that node and nothing else. It couldn't use it to traverse the rest of the document. It couldn't use it to get to the network. It couldn't use it to steal our cookies. It couldn't do any of those things. All it could do was display an ad in that window. And uh, AdSafe worked. And it used the same monadic pattern. 
Um, so let's uh, improve our macroid to allow us to do Ajax stuff. Um, so we've already seen we've got, um, we can take an, a, an object and call a bind on it, but what we really want to be able to do is call a method on it. And um, so the way we'll do that, and, and also we want to be able to have methods pass some uh, variable number of parameters as well. So we'll expand, expand our bind method to now take an optional second parameter, which is an array of the arguments that we want to get to the method. And we'll extend our, our macroid uh, by um, first creating an, a prototype object, which will be an object which inherits nothing. This is where we're going to, where we're going to keep the methods um, of the monad. Uh, we can use object.create of null to, to make that for us. That makes an object that inherits nothing. This is a, a great new feature that came in with ES5. And then when we create our monad, we will have it inherit from that prototype object. So anything that goes into the prototype object will be inherited by the monads that we make. Uh, then we'll modify the bind method to take the second argument, which um, is the set of arguments that we want to pass into the method. And unfortunately, because of a profound stupidity in the way JavaScript was designed, we have to manipulate the um, arguments object. And that's really hard because it is not a real object. And so it's just the things you have to do to it are horrible. Fortunately, um, ES6, the next edition of the language, will probably have this dot, dot, dot operator, which happens to do exactly the right thing. This is going to be my second favorite feature in ES6 if it ever comes out. Um, so I'm looking forward to that because it took those three extremely ugly lines and turned it into one very neat line, which obviously does what it does. Um, we're then going to create a unit method on the uh, constructor, which will allow us to add additional methods to the prototype. And it, it simply, it's, takes its arguments and assigns them to the prototype. So that's pretty easy. And it also returns unit so that we can then call dot method dot method dot method on the constructor. So it's monadic in that dimension as well. But we can do even better than that. Um, uh, it assumed that the methods that, uh, or the functions that get called to method understand about monads. But in some cases, we want to be able to wrap functions that know nothing about monads, but have them work in the monadic context. So we're going to add another method to the constructor called lift. And lift will take an ordinary, ob ordinary function and add it to the prototype. But it will wrap that function in another function, which will call unit and bind, as suggested in the first two axioms, um, so that it allows that function to act as though it knew about monads, even though it didn't. So it'll um, call bind for us, and it will then wrap its result in a monad if it needs to. So that makes things a lot easier. So let's use this one. So um, we're going to call our uh, macroid again um, and to, to make our Ajax monad. And we're going to use lift to turn alert into a method on it. So um, we could change the name here, but we're going to keep the name the same. We're going to take the alert function and use it as the alert method. So now I can call um, the Ajax constructor to make my monad, and the monad now has an alert method. And if I call it, it'll say, hello world. Hooray. Um, turns out we've been doing this for years. We just didn't know it. Um, Ajax has always been monadic. Um, the, uh, one of the, the difficulties we have in some of our modern languages is the problem with null. Null is the thing that represents a value that is not there. And if you try to do something to null, generally something bad will happen. Sometimes it seems that um, Java was optimized for the generation of null pointer exceptions. And so you end up having the null pointer exception doesn't actually ever tell you anything except that, oh, there was a null that you didn't check there to avoid. And so your code tends to get filled with lots of if null, don't do that, if null, don't do that, which is just a waste of time, right? It's completely unproductive. We knew we didn't want to do that. You know, we shouldn't have to say so every time uh, we touch a, a variable that might want to null. So there's a thing called the maybe nomad, 
the maybe monad takes null pointer exceptions and, and simply removes them from your model so you never have to worry about them anymore. It's similar to the way that NAN works. A long time ago, um, in Fortran and other languages, if you ever accidentally divided something by zero, your program would stop. You know, an exception thing crashes, cores, done, stops. So as a result, you had to write in front of every division, but if we're dividing by zero, then don't do it. You never intended to have it happen, but you had to guard against it all the time. Um, so we now have NAN, and NAN represents not a number. It's sometimes the result of dividing by zero. Um, and so if we divide by zero, we get NAN instead, and the program keeps going. And at the end, you can ask, oh, by the way, is the answer NAN? And you know that, OK, something happened. We can ignore the result. So that's much nicer than having to put guards around every operator to make sure that nothing is going to go wrong. The maybe monad allows us to do a similar thing with pointers or with references, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. They just, those errors don't happen. So um, we're going to uh, modify our macroid in order to be able to deal with maybe monads. So we're going to add a parameter to the macroid which takes a modifier function. And that modifier function will allow us to intercept things that, are re that we're constructing. Um, so the unit method, as part of its doing work, will look to see if the modifier function is present, and if so, it will call it, uh, passing the monad and the value, and that will allow that function that we pass in to do something with the thing that we're making. Um, so one way we could do that is we can use the macroid to make a maybe macro, or maybe mac, uh, monad, by passing in this function which will look to, at the value and see if the value is null or undefined. And if it is, then we go, OK, this is going to be a null monad. And it's going to have this amazing property in that we're going to change its bind method to do nothing. It'll simply return the monad. Uh, so it turns it into an identity function. And crashes don't occur. Um, so now we can make our maybe monad. In this case, we'll make a null one. And if I call uh, bind on, al on alert, nothing happens. It's great. So if, if you incorporate this kind of stuff into your, into your system, you never again have to worry about null pointer errors. It's just amazing. You just go away. Um, bind will prevent it ever from getting called, and everything works right, which is nice. It's a liberating thing. Uh, so that's our friend, the monad. That's really, that's it. Um, and there, uh, we looked at three specific monads, the identity monad, the Ajax monad, the maybe monad. There are lots more, but they're all variations on this pattern. Um, and now that you've been through this talk, um, you might want to go look at the other monad tutorials. So you know, go to Bing and Google for you know, monad burrito and, and see what you find. It's going to be baffling stuff, but, but it'll work. Uh, so I have some time left, so I want to talk about concurrency. Concurrency is when you try to make um, lots of things happen at the same time. And there are a number of models for how you do that. The most popular is to use threads. Um, and the problem with threads is that they are evil with respect to mutation. If you have a process that's trying to do a read, modify, write, and another process that's trying to do a read, modify, write, and they're doing it on the same memory, there's a strong likelihood that they're going to clobber each other. And that's called races, and races are, are horrendously bad for um, reliability. Uh, the way we mitigate that is with mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion has its own set of problems. Um, gen it can cause bad performance problems, or more likely it's going to cause deadlocks and, and starvation. And that's a bad thing, too. There's a, there are a couple of other alternatives. One of them is to go with um, purely functional programming, because when we're purely functional, we never mutate. and so. That's not a problem, but not mutating is its own problem. Another alternative is turn-based processing. Um, this, I think, is the, the right way forward. So in a turn-based system, everything is single-threaded. And as a result, we are race-free and deadlock-free. And that turns out to be great. But it requires that we respect the law of turns. And the law of turns says your code must never wait 
It must never block and it must finish fast. A turn cannot sit there and loop waiting for something to happen. It has to get out as quick as it can. So not all programs can be easily adapted to that, but it turns out quite a lot of them can. So event-driven systems uh, tend to be turn-based. Message passing systems tend to be turn-based. Um, you don't need threads, you don't need uh, mutual exclusion. It's a much simpler programming model um, and it's really effective. Turns out all web browsers use this model. Uh, most UI frameworks use this model. So it's something we've been doing a long time anyway. We're now seeing um, this model getting more popularity on the server side. So um, there's Elko for Java, there's Twisted for Python, Node.js for JavaScript. Take the same turn-based model and make it available on the server. Now some people complain that asynchronicity can be hard to manage. Um, and there are some things you need to do uh, in order to adapt to it. Uh, one of the problems is that um, if you have multiple things that each serially depend on each other, uh, the naive way to write that is with nested event handlers. And that turns out to be an extremely brittle pattern, so you don't want to do that. A much better alternative is to use promises. Promises are objects which will represent a future value and a way of interacting with that future value. So um, promises are an excellent mechanism for dealing with asynchronicity. Um, every promise has a corresponding resolver, which um, is used to ultimately assign a value to that promise. And once the value is assigned, then interesting things can happen. So a, a promise, when it's created, will have one of three states. Well, it will, its first state will be pending. And depending on what happens to it in the future, it can change to either kept or broken, or it may always be pending. Um, so a promise is an event generator. Uh, once the promise is resolved, then it can fire events on, on consumers who are interested in the result of the promise. Um, so at any time after making uh, a promise, an event handling function can be registered with the promise, um, and those uh, will then be called in the order in which they were uh, registered when the value is known. And a promise can accept functions that will be called with the value once the promise has been kept or broken. And we can do this with the when method. Uh, the when is sort of like on. It, it allows us to register event handlers, but it will register two of them, one to be called if the promise is kept, and the other to be called if the promise is broken. Um, so here's a function for making a, a promise, um, calling it vow. So a vow will produce a, a, an object. And that object will have three methods, um, keep, break, or, or promise. Promise is not actually a method, it's um, an object which represents the promise itself. So I can take the promise and hand it to you. Um, and in the future, when I know what the result of that promise is, I can call either keep or break, and then your promise will change its state and good things happen. Um, so here's an example. So um, one of the problems with uh, file system APIs, um, going all the way back to Fortran, is that they block. Um, if, if I want to read something from the card reader or from the terminal, or if, um, if I want to send something to the printer or to the disk drive, my program stops until that operation has completed. And in some cases, my program can stop for a long time. I don't want to stop because that breaks the law of turns. The law of turns says I never stop, I never break, I have to finish. Um, and so a way to do that would be to have the file system instead of blocking, it immediately returns a promise. So my program can then continue going, I'm not blocked on it. Um, so here I've got a uh, read file uh, instruction, uh, name is probably the name of a file and it's going to return a promise. And I can tell that promise, when you are resolved, call my success function, and it will res receive the result of the file operation and things are good. And if the file operation failed for some reason, you know, like file not found or whatever, then call my failure function instead. Now you might be wondering, why do you call my failure function? Why don't you just throw an exception? We well, have to think about this stuff as time travel. So what, um, an exception does is it unwinds the stack to some earlier point in time, and we can then recover from that point. But in a turn-based system, the stack gets 
reset all the way down to zero at the end of every turn. So there's no way I can unwind into a previous turn because the stack is gone. There's no way to go back in time. You can only go forward in time. So we need a time travel mechanism which goes forward. Turns out promises do that, right? That's, that's the whole point. And so promises can have a, a positive consequence or a negative consequence. That negative consequence is like an exception. So the way we deal with exceptions is by having failure functions instead, which will be called once we, in the future, once we know that the thing actually failed. Um, so I just, I think I said all of that. Exceptions modify the flow of control by unwinding the state. The turn-based system, the stack is empty at every turn, right. So um, one of the nice things about um, the way failure functions work is that we can, um, uh, we can nest promises, so each when actually returns another promises, promise based on the, re on the resolution of that particular when. And we can cascade those as well. So we can say, and when we know the result of that, do this, and when we know the result of that, do that, and so on. And if any of those fail, and if they don't specify their own failure, then the failure propagates or, or it's contagious. It goes forward, and so the last one, the last failure specified, will catch all of the previous things. So it, it acts sort of like a, a, a try, except this is something that's happening over many, many turns. So it gives us a way to, to manage asynchronicity. Um, so one of the nice things about promises and, and the when method is how they compose. So when I say dot when dot when, that's doing the same thing as a when passing in a function which calls when on another promise. And some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, this looks eerily familiar. Uh, where have I seen this before? And you might be thinking, this, is, this looks like the third axiom. And I would say, you are right. This is the third axiom. It turns out promises are monads. Now, they're a different kind of monad because in all the other monads we've looked at, um, the value of the monad is known at the time that it's created. And because it's purely functional, they can, that value cannot be modified. This is a little different because we don't know the value at the time that the thing's created that's going to be resolved in the future. So it gets filled in later. Um, also, because monads don't have the, the problem where they might fail to ever get that value, uh, we only need to provide one function to bind. But when needs the ability to have two functions because it has to deal with the failure case. But otherwise, it works exactly like the monads. So. Um, Let's look at how we could build the val function in order to do this. Uh, now, this is about a page worth of code. And, and I'll show you the page at the end, but you're not going to be able to read it. So I'm going to be zooming in on pieces of it. Um, so uh, we've got a, a function that is going to return an object. And that function is going to have a couple of methods or functions in it that the uh, yellow function will close over. It's one of the, the nice construction patterns that we have. And the thing that we're assigning to vow is not the green function, it's the result of the green function, because uh, we're invoking it here at the bottom. So uh, that little pair of parents is really easy to overlook, but it turns out is really critical to understanding this. Um, so just leaving it hanging out there like a, a pair of dog balls I don't think is useful to the reader. Um, I, I want the reader to have a, a bigger clue that this is important. So I recommend wrapping the entire invocation expression in parents. So it makes it a little easier for the reader to see this is all part of the same thing. This is important. If I see a function in parents, that probably means something, and I need to, to look for that. Um, OK, so let's zoom in on the make function. Um, it's going to have a couple of arrays where it's going to keep the uh, the uh, success functions and failure functions that get registered with it. Um, it's going to uh, have a variable for the ultimate fate of this promise once it's known. Um, its status starts off as pending. JavaScript doesn't have symbols, doesn't really need them because uh, strings were implemented correctly. Uh, two strings containing the same letters are equal, which is, right, it'd be stupid for them not to be equal, wouldn't it? Um, and then it returns a, uh, an object containing the break method, the keep method, 
and the promise itself, which is an object. We'll look at its construction in a moment. Um, and break and keep both call a herald function, which is going to announce to the world uh, the resolution of this promise. So we'll look at herald. Herald can only be called once. So if the current state is not pending, then uh, we can throw. In this case, throwing is OK because it's a local thing. It's not something that we need to throw into a different turn. Um, we'll set the fate, and we will enlighten the queue of waiters and let them know that um, the fate is known. And we'll then zero out the, um, the two queues to make sure that um, none of those functions ever get called again. Uh, OK, so let's zoom in on something else now. We're going to zoom in on, on the promise. Uh, the promise will have a uh, property that just identifies itself as a promise to make it a little easier to recognize it. And it contains the when method. Um, the when method is going to register the two event handlers that depend on the result of the, the promise. Um, and how it'll do that will depend on the current state of the promise. If, if they're pending, then they simply get added to the queue. If the promise has already been resolved, then it will, um, depending on whether we're relying on the failure case or, or the other case, we'll enqueue it and then enlighten immediately. Um, so it doesn't matter when the promise is resolved versus when we register with the when method. So there's no race there. You can register after uh, the promise is resolved and it works exactly the same way. So you don't need to care about how that race may occur. And then at the end, we return the promise. Um, then this is the business that happens when we enqueue the thing. I'm, I'm getting bored now, so I'm just going to skip through this stuff. Um, and, and there's that. So um, the, the code is available on GitHub if you want to play with it. Um, it's, it's all written in JavaScript. Um, this is it. There's just one page. You might want to write that down. Um, so our friend, the monad. So we saw the identity monad, the Ajax monad, the maybe monad, and the promise monad. I contend that promises are monads, which this is my contribution to this, I, I guess. I, I don't think this result had been known before. Um, I have some, oh, and don't forget your semicolons, people. I mean, it's really important. Um, I've got some further viewing for you. Um, uh, Carl Hewitt um, was at MIT. I think he's at Stanford now. He came up with the actor model, which inspired um, the development of the scheme language and a lot of other stuff. I think the actor model contains the solution to most of our problems. Um, but um, Carl has not written any accessible material uh, about it. Um, it's all kind of, you've read it obviously, it's, it's scary stuff. Um, but he did do an interview with uh, Channel 9 at Microsoft, and it's actually a very uh, nice introduction to the stuff, so I recommend you take a look at that. Channel 9 apparently likes the really long URLs, uh, and I doubt that there's anybody in this room who could actually type that in. Um, but I'm sure if you go search for it, you'd, you should be able to find it. Then uh, Mark Miller is um, one of the first people to come up with promises, which um, is based on an idea called futures, which uh, also came out of Carl's actor model. Um, he's implemented a number of languages, and, and you just saw an implementation in JavaScript. Um, he has a really interesting couple of talks that are available on your YouTube, which um, uh, talk about this and some of its implications for doing um, automated contracting and, and uh, financial instruments and, and lots of other really interesting stuff. So I, I recommend you take a look at that as well. It's uh, certainly worth your time. And Miller works here, by the way. He's, he is a Googler, good guy. And, and that's it. That's all I've got for you this hour. Uh, thank you and good night. So I, I'm guessing you have a few minutes maybe to answer a couple yeah. of questions. Um, in an effort to keep the video in sync with questions, I've got a lab here, so I will walk around. Anybody who wants to ask a question, just so we can capture it. And uh, while, we're, while we're talking about that, nothing confidential, please. Uh, this will be going public afterwards. Um, so you want to start? Thanks for the talk. I was wondering, what's your take on the cancellation of promises? Because that's one of the questions that hasn't been really resolved. On like the can can cancellation of promises. when. I register my listener to a promise, and I'm not interested in the result anymore. 
Right, so that's a really easy thing to resolve on, on your side. You can have, your, have a Boolean at the top of your responder which says, am I interested anymore or not? Um, so you, know, you can do it that way. Um, but promises also compose really nicely. You can cascade them together and stuff. And so um, you can have uh, a canceller you know, in that string. You can compose cancellation. So there are lots of higher level uh, patterns that you can build out of the, the simple promises. Is there a way to communicate to the resolver that you're not interested anymore, so it doesn't need to do the work to generate the resolver? Uh, is, there, is there a way to, to communicate to the resolver? Not in the promise uh, system itself, um, but uh, yeah, you can always send them a message. And it, it's similar to um, a problem you might have in, say, uh, timers, right? You can have a queue of timers, and you might want to say, I'm not interested in this timer anymore, and so you want to cancel it. But it might be that by the time you get the cancellation to it, it's already fired, so it's likely you're going to experience races. Um, so that's probably not a pattern you want to pursue, but it it is available to you. Uh, um, it seems that uh, debugging is a real challenge for turn-based programming. If you set a breakpoint in a conventional program, you can uh, you know, see the call chain that led, that gave you the context for why you're there. You can step over, you know, uh, you know, sub functions and. Uh, you know, skip whole subtrees of the uh, evaluation uh, uh, tree, and that seems to be a lot more complicated in debugging. Is there practical tools for uh, debugging turn-based programs? I think it's a lot easier than trying to debug threads. I mean, the hardest thing I've ever done in my career is try to debug a, a, a real-time problem where two threads were chasing each other. I, I think turns are a lot easier to manage than that. Uh, debugging is always going to be hard, um, and as we get you know, more temporal complexity, it gets harder. But I think um, turns manage that complexity much better than threads do. Uh, sir, I got the floating mic, so I'm going to make my way to the front in a second. We've got one more here. Um, do you have any thoughts on emulating do notation in JavaScript? Or have there been any attempts at that? Uh, thoughts on, on what? Emulating do notation, uh, the, like monadic do syntax? Um, no. I mean, w one thing we're seeing in, in JavaScript now is a lot of experimentation with new syntax. You know, CoffeeScript sort of launched that. Well, no, there were, there were other examples before that. But there are lots of people who are trying to experiment with, uh, you know, changing the language or, or making it more expressive. Um, I expect we'll see that research continue. Um, we're, we don't see promises uh, as a feature in ES6. Uh, possibly ES7, but uh, I'm, I'm not confident as to what's going to make it into ES6 right now, so uh, it's uh, dangerous to predict what's going to be in 7, uh, and whether it will bring new syntax with it as well, it's, I don't know. Does the cost of making closures in JavaScript make these um, monadic approaches infeasible right now? Does, uh, no, I, closures aren't that expensive. I mean, they're, they're just function objects, and um, they're great. I mean, um, a lot of stuff gets enabled by this. Now, you, you could take a, you know, sort of uh, a, a simpler approach to some of these things. I mean, there is a cost, um, but very few of our JavaScript programs are compute bound. I mean, they're mostly bound by everything else. Um, so I, I don't think it's a concern. I think this is easily affordable. Is this a public video? Yes. I'll add. Okay. okay. <laughs> any any non-confidential questions? <laughs> <laughs> Those are quite a bunch. All right. I, I think you, you stumbled into silence, though. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>